in the lobby of the Comfort Inn. This is called the conference. <laughs> the train got stuck on the tracks, hung up on its own throat outside the Comfort Inn in Missoula. I can see the river from my room, and though it probably should, it holds no ice this year. The breakfast bar is sausage gravy and cold white biscuits, is vanilla creamer from a pump and squares of mixed berry jelly. I corner myself where I'm most comfortable and look out at the circle of coffee drinkers talking game. The woman with the loud voice adjusts her ponytail and guides the men who sit among her through their usual paces. Ball. They are coaches or would-be or wannabe, but for certain, they are sideline coaches and parents of once teenagers who came up playing basketball. And then I notice their insignia, the cotton sweatshirts, the heavy gold watches, rimless reading glasses, white Reeboks. The woman is from Northern Colorado, or else likes it there, or else has visited there. The mountains on her sweatshirt cut a sharp line behind embossed yellow letters. She begins her show with the team, excuse me, she begins her show with the team of her daughter's youth, in which her daughter was the only one, quote, not an Asian. The coach was an Asian too, the men nod. So her daughter, though not particularly tall, played post. The men nod and laugh. Well, she certainly wasn't a post, the daughter, but she wasn't an Asian either, so she was happy to tower that season. The woman notices I'm listening, looking her in the eye, unsmiling, unlaughing, unimpressed. She sees me but does not see me or register me as someone who would not appreciate her stories. Another time, says the woman, the daughter traveled to South Carolina for the big conference game. She leans in toward the circled men, says in incrementally quieter tones, leading up to a fake, loud whisper, well, we showed up, and you know, we were the only, you know, the only team there. The men nod because they do know. They've already guessed. Well, we were the only team there that wasn't. And I know it's coming too, sure as sausage gravy shit. And it's here that I want the remote control and not just to turn down the volume of the hovering television behind the woman's head where the same lies about Ferguson are playing out again, where resignation itches in its double skin, but to mute her face, to pause her expression so I can really get a good look at her eyes because from my corner, I can see the sparkle the spark behind them, just lit with the words she thinks need to be dramatized. I want to see her pupils widen, maybe reach out and feel her pulse on the brink of it quickening as she's about to perform her obvious secret. Because that's what she means in her rhetoric, in her lead-in. The little round bomb she has already produced from the folds of her sweatshirt revealed and obvious but dangerous too in its certain detonation. This wacky explosion, bang, bang, that black girls are who were waiting there in South Carolina. Yeah, yeah, the men nod, picking up their heels. Teams of them, bang, teams of black girl bodies jostling their daughters around that court. And those girls, you know, they play a whole different game. The men rear. The train sighs and shudders on the rails. Those girls, those girls are, of course, not like her girl. And her girl, well, she was no post, but she shone that tournament, earned herself, no, maintained respect, because though she wasn't a natural, she had talent. And boy, did it make those black girls think twice. Bang! The men foam, nodding. The train is let loose is easing along the same, same track. The woman looks around. A black man has filled his plate at the egg bar. She sees him, lowers her voice. He is tall, tall, 
sits at the table next to her. She turns, says hello, asks him if he plays basketball. Satisfied, she turns and picks up her story again, this time omitting the word black, letting the smoke of it hover, reconstructing her vantage point. Her daughter's team did well, even though they were, you know, the only ones. Thank you very much.